Amen. Amen. What great worship this morning. What great worship. Would you pray with your pastor? Father, we come, Lord, and at times we do say, why me, Lord? But also, we realize over time that things that we go through, we may not understand at that time, but we, we eventually see it. Sometimes we may not see it and understand it until we see you face to face, but there's times that you do give us a glimpse and you do show us and and we get to help someone else that is going through that same trial, that same situation that we have went through. Lord, I'm convinced that that's going to happen with Carrie, Lord, and, and she's going through a test right now, but she's going to have a testimony. And Lord, so many are going to be impacted by this. You never waste a hurt, Lord. We know that. We praise you. We thank you. We love you, Lord. Go with us now. Be with us as we crack open your word and teach it and preach it and proclaim it. Hide us behind the cross, Lord. Turn us loose and let us preach this morning. Let me preach to people I love. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Let's be well dressed for Christ. You say, what, is that? what does that mean, Pastor? What are we looking at this morning? Well, you've heard that expression and that saying that clothes make the man. came from the old great theologian Mark Twain. And we've also heard a lot about how <coughs> we know about how clothes say a lot about a person, don't they? But at times we cannot be too presumptuous, and we may see someone with tattered clothing, or someone with old clothing on, old blue jeans, an old shirt. Truth of the matter is, they make a buy and sell a whole lot of people. Don't be, don't be deceived by what you see on the outside. But we also heard that expression, dress for success, haven't we? We were on the way to church a while ago, and Noah says, Daddy, it's June. It's hot. What are you doing with a coat on? I said, son, I want to look good. He said, Daddy, you don't have to do that to look good. I said, maybe you're right, but I'm going to try anyway. I need all the help I can get. I'm not like some of y'all that just pop up out of bed and you look pretty. I have to, I'm like an old pig. You still put, you put makeup on a pig, he's still a pig, isn't he? I, it takes a while to get this to look good, okay? And so I have to do all I can to help it. But there's a major problem with styles, with change. And, they, and styles change quickly, don't they? But isn't it amazing how things that we, we used to wear come back around in style? And, 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 and they come back around and you say, hey, I, I used to wear those. I remember growing up, we used to pick at those kids and, and make fun of them. Now, I didn't do that. We used to pick at them if they wore champion clothes and going, man, where'd they get that at? They got that, that old Kmart store that old, or that old thrift store or, or they got that for next to nothing. Now kids are paying money for champion because they think they look like a champion if they wear that stuff. And, and that's just the way it is. It just kind of comes and goes. But I have... Good news this morning for us as devoted Christ followers. Those styles that vary culture to culture and, and what's viewed as, as acceptable and even attractive in one culture is seen as offensive and maybe a poor taste to another. <coughs> Excuse me. But the good news is that I have this morning is what was in style in the first century is still in style in the 21st century. You say, well, what are you talking about, Pastor? There's no situation or season where Jesus will ever be out of date. There's no situation or, or time where trying to look like Jesus will be a bad thing. Now, we live in a, I will say this, we live in a society. We live in a country now that 
as time has went on, if you want to look like Jesus, act like Jesus, talk like Jesus, be like Jesus, you're going to be made fun of. Called, I've been called Bible thumper I don't know how many times. I've been called this and that and other, other remarks. But still, who are we going to be today? Are we going to be well-dressed for Christ? Are we going to stand for Christ? Are we going to look like Jesus in a society that says that's not popular? We want to do what we want to do. We, we, we want to, we're, 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 we're doing the things we want to do to make us happy. God, our God wants us to be happy, happy, happy. He, he wants us to, <coughs> he wants us to uh, continually uh, strive to be happy. No. You and I know, those of us who know the Word, have been in the Word, spend any time in God's Word and Scripture, know that God longs for holiness not just happiness, but putting on spiritual clothing that accurately reflects our Savior is so important and it's fitting for all occasions. Garments like love, peace, God's Word, Scripture, thankfulness will never be looked at as out of date. They'll always be in date. They'll always be relevant to people needing to hear God's Word, needing to hear the Gospel. What I mean is there are types of apparel that Christ followers can put on each day that never go out of style. They never go out of date. Those things like love that I just mentioned. Their love, their peace, the Word of Christ, being thankful. People may look at you and go, he, he or she is peculiar. Why in the world... Why are they so at peace? Right here they shouldn't be. Why are they so... Uh, why are they t trusting in the Lord when all, they, they went through all this? Because they know, we know that He's the one that got us through all this, don't we? We know what God has done. We've been there. We've got the t-shirt to prove it. You know, I was amazed Friday after uh, Carrie's surgery going in to see her. And, and she just... Walk in, hi, hi, Brother Ben. And she's just smiling. And she says, she says, Brother Ben, I'm going to praise him. I'm going to praise him regardless. I'm going to praise him. Somebody's going to get something out of this. I said, Lord, we're about to have church in here. We just, we're about to have to take up an offering right there in the hospital room. She had a blessed time and, and been in such good spirits. And I think that's going to go a long way in toward that healing process. And helping the family, helping her, helping Randy. And, and just, she, she knows this and she realizes that. But I know she's trying to be strong. But I also know I see a faithfulness about her. And I see someone at peace, even in the midst of trials and hard times. You know, this morning, if you have your Bible, we're going to be in Colossians 3, 12 through 17. You, you probably thought, is he ever going to get to the Word of God? Yes, I'm getting there. Colossians 3, 12 through 17. And we're going to talk about what it looks like to put on things. Yes, you can please stand with me as I read God's Word. Last week we talked about putting off. This week we're going to talk about putting on. <coughs> Colossians 3, 12 through 17 says, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, Forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanksgiving in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Be seated if you can, church family. Oh, I, that, ought to, that ought to just light your fire this morning. That, for, for, well, first of all, that I love how Paul starts this passage. He says, put on then as God's chosen ones. Maybe somebody hadn't told you lately, but you've been chosen. You're important. You matter. You know, we all know what it's like to be dressed for the occasion, don't we? And I want, to, I want you to admit it. There are times when we really, we want to get out of bed. We get out of bed and we got our 
PJs on or, or our uh, comfy clothes on. And man, we just want to, you don't have to raise your hand, but we just want to stay in those clothes half a day or all day, don't we? It's just comfortable. Used to, you remember, we used to go, when you go out to the supermarket, you go to Walmart, go wherever, people put on clothes. I see people in their pajamas in Walmart now. I say, God bless you, do, do you not know how to dress? Bless your heart, do you need some clothes? But I don't say that to them, but I'm thinking it. But they may be comfortable in Walmart, and that's okay. And, and you say, Pastor, that's the way we are around here. Well, but God bless you, all didn't tell me that. I didn't get to that memo. But it's okay, maybe I need to wear my best pajamas. But admit it, there are times when really, we really want to keep them comfy clothes on, don't we? That we wear around the house. But responsibilities require proper attire. Certain situations dictate the clothes we wear, don't they? You know, you don't go for a walk in dress shoes, do you? You're not going to get too far. It's going to be uncomfortable. If I go outside in these clothes right here I got on, in a, in a, in a sport jacket and khakis, and I throw the football with Noah, that ain't going to work, is it? I mean, I can get out there with him, but I'm going to sweat like a hog. I really am, and, and, and I need to be comfortable. And we like to, we, we're boys, we, we like to get out there and, and wrestle and fight and tickle and, and, and get physical, man. We just, we're men. That's what men do. And Jen's like, she's going, would you stop all that? Would you get, you get too loud? I said, honey, that's what boys do. And, and she's the only, only girl in the house. I call it three men and a baby. But it works. You know, and, and times like these, we want to throw that summer outfit on. And try to keep cool, don't we? When, cold, when colder weather comes, we'll bundle up, won't we? We can't, we can't put enough clothes on. And then, you know, we clothe ourselves, I wonder, as believers. How do we clothe ourselves as believers this morning? <clears throat> do you clothe yourselves in godliness where, like you're commanded to here in Colossians 3? Or are you clothing yourselves in a way you shouldn't? Put on as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. You know, so why are we to put on godly garments and be well-dressed for Christ? Why is that? It's because those of us who are Christ followers, we met Jesus, we know Him, and we have a relationship with Him. And we're known as God's chosen ones, and we're going to stand out. We're going to show extra godliness. We're going to show that, hey, we've been changed from the inside out. And here's how. Here's what we want you to see. Not only are we chosen, but we're holy and beloved. And this means that we're set apart by God. And we're, I love that word beloved. We become special to God. We're special to Him. We're loved in a unique way that only His child can be loved. He doesn't love animals the way He loves me and you. He, he doesn't love any other creation the way He loves me and you. Me and you are, we are uh, made in His image. Of all he made, we're made in his image. I love how we're described as God's children in 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. It says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellence of him who called you out of darkness and into marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you've received mercy. Can I get an amen? Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful that he picked you up, dusted you off, and now you are God, one of God's people. You, received, you had not received mercy, but now mercy's come your way. Look here, look here. Good times have come our way, not because of anything we've done, but because of what Jesus did on that cross and because of, that he had you on his mind. Paul goes on to share five traits in verse 12 that we'll, we'll show if we're properly dressed. We're putting on love. And if we're putting on love, we're going to show these. We'll have compassionate hearts filled with kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. In a sense, it's kind of a summary of Galatians 5, 22 and 23 that we know that talks about the fruits of the Spirit there. And... and we should, we'll show these if we're his children. When it comes to compassion, when it comes to compassion, I wonder this morning, when's the last time you wept over, over your neighborhood, over your community? 
When's the last time you thought about those in Asheville, Odenville, Springville, the surrounding area? Thought about those that are lost. And you just wept over them. And you just thought, if they died right now, they're going to hell. They're separated from the Lord. In a sense, we need to do that. It's okay to do that. Does it break your heart that you have friends and neighbors in Odenville, Alabama, Springville, Alabama, and other places that don't know Jesus? And, and again, if I, like I said, if they died right now, they wouldn't be in heaven. It ought to make us want to dress for success. And by success, I mean winning people for Jesus. It ought to make us want to come to people. We look at Luke 19, 41. Verse 41 there says, when he, and it talks about Jesus. It says, when he drew near and he saw the city, he got to Jerusalem. It says, when Jesus drew near and he saw the city, he wept over it. It's okay to cry over Asheville, Alabama, Springville, Alabama, Odenville, Alabama, and say, Lord, give us revival. Lord, people need you. Put me in the right place. Let me be in the right area so I can tell more about you. You may think you're going to get you a biscuit at Jack's in the morning, but no, you've got a divine appointment. You're going to meet somebody there that's going to need to hear about Jesus. You're going, you're, you're going to go to Walmart, and I hope you get your good clothes on, not your pajamas, but you're going to go, and, and you're going to meet people, and they're going to need to hear a word from the Lord, and God's going to use you to do it. You say, Pastor, all I got my I got my shopping cart list. I got my list here. That's all I'm thinking about. No, 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 no. God's got other things in mind. He wants to use you. He wants to use you to bring hope. If we'll have compassionate hearts, there's no telling what the Lord will do. Jesus was so moved with compassion for people that he wept over them. He fed them. He healed them. He changed their lives from the inside out. As his followers, we should. Be the greatest helpers of the poor, the blind, the sick, the needy, the compassionate. Though showing compassion and compassion and love is an action rooted with a tender heart. You know, <clears throat> I had something happen this week here in the church office that just blew me away. I'm learning. I'm still learning how we do things here, and, and y'all got to be patient with me and give me grace. And had a had a family come in this week and. That had a need, and, and uh, I didn't know. I thought, well, the pastor meets with a family that has a, a benevolence need, and I wasn't sure, so I go meet with them. I'm talking to them, and, and uh, Jimmy says, Pastor, come here. I go in his office, we're chatting. He says, uh, he starts telling me about what's going on, and I, I said, well, don't they need me? No, we got a committee for that. I said, but bless God. A committee set up for benevolence? Yeah. If you're here this morning, and you serve on that committee, I want to say thank you. Thank you for being willing to show compassion and help and bless. And it's a calling. That is a great committee. Thank you for what you do. And, and also, I've been made aware that Jimmy told me about how, Pastor, you, you don't understand. It's been this way for a while now. And he says, when that, when that, when that benevolence amount gets so low, it's not even a budget item. And when it gets so low, we go to the congregation and say, hey, we need some help. And, and people just give. And needs are met. I said, well, bless God. I had big old tears. I said, you got to be kidding me. So people just, they just give out of the goodness of their heart. Well, why am I going to preach on Compassion Sunday? I already had my message planned out. The Lord said, tell them anyway. I said, okay. Y'all are already compassionate. You're already giving. I was blown away. But you know what, you know what, you know what set things apart from me? When I met with that family that had a need, they said, Pastor, uh, the, the, the father of the house pointed and my daughter goes to St. Clair County High School. I said, okay. And he says, uh, he says, Pastor, the thing about it is, we ask them for help and they said, go to Friendship. They'll help you. I said, they told you that? Amen. I said, we've already established something here. They already know. The school system already knows. Somebody nearby, go to Friendship. They'll help you. They'll bless you. They already know what God's doing here and how God is directing and how God is asking us and, and, and calling, calling upon us to be compassionate helpers. And we're doing that already. And I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart as your pastor. It made me so proud. It made me so proud to hear those words. Go to Friendship. They'll help you. I said, my goodness, they already paved the, 
way for me to go in there. And so I, I'm going to get with the school pretty soon, and we're going to get in with first priority, and I'm going to get over and preach the gospel and, and, and to the school, to the students, and, and we're going to have an invitation. And, and my prayer is that there'll be every head bowed, every eye closed, and people will come to Jesus. And so hearing that made me so proud as your pastor. I just need to say that this morning. If we're going to reflect our Savior and continue to do that, we must continually show kindness even when we don't feel like it. Thoughtfulness, considered attitude, and acts of benevolence, that's when we show who we are. That's when we show Jesus. When we care for those in our community, especially those struggling and hurting, we're being like the Good Samaritan. Y'all remember that story uh, from Luke 10? I love that story and how this, uh, this gentleman had been beaten and, and robbed and, and left for dead and had a couple pass by there and, and a priest pass by there. Well, finally, the Good Samaritan come along. What did he do? He said, well, i got to help this man. He picks him up, dusts him off, cleans him up, uh, gets him lodging, gets him food, helps him. I'm paraphrasing there. But you remember that story. And I love that story. And that makes me think of, of you all, how I know my church family. If they come along and they saw somebody hurting, somebody in need, somebody uh, that basically needed love and compassion and were left for dead, we're going to pick them up, dust them off, and help them, aren't we? That's just what we do. While serving, we must have the attitude that esteems others above ourselves. We must have humility. I love this definition, humility. I use it, but we must, we must have humility, be humble. It's, humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. And so it's the opposite of pride and human comparison. It, com it compares itself always to Jesus. And we always want to look like Jesus. Philippians 2, 3, and 4. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let, it, let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also the interest of others. We must show meekness, also known as gentleness, to others. And, and patience is not easy, is it? You wives don't be able on your husbands. Patience is not easy. But also we must... Be something that, it, it has to be something we possess as a Christ follower. Ask Jen if it's easy to be patient with me. She'll tell you. Don't tell them, honey. You want to, I know, but don't tell them. But along with these five traits, we must bear with one another in love, as, as verse 13 talks about, and commands. Forgiving one another is the hardest garment of love to put on, but it may be the most important. When we don't forgive, we develop bitterness that can in turn uh, lead to your relationship with the Lord and others being strained and hurt. I wonder, is there anything within our church body that is causing disunity? Anything, any, 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 any elephant in the room that maybe I don't know about between others and between different people, different groups in the church, is there something that's causing disunity? If so, we need to come as an individual or individuals and seek forgiveness as God Ask, and, and we can't bless others as the church desires until we seek unity among the body. All across the board, all across the church body, we got to have unity. we got to be on one page. We can't have different factions and anything else, or anything else like a clique or anything like that. And some people say, well, there's cliques in the church. There's cliques in every church, but there ought not be. If there's cliques here, we need to do away with them. We need to ask God to reveal them, and then we need to put them under... The blood of Christ. I love what Ephesians 4, 2 and 3 says. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. You may ask, well, how do we get there? <clears throat> how do we get there? How do we completely forgive, Pastor? Somebody's hurt me. You don't understand. Well, the last phrase in Colossians 3, 3, 13 answers that question. It says, as the Lord has forgiven you, you, you must also forgive. Remember, remember this. You will never forgive anyone as much as Christ has forgiven you. As much as Christ has forgiven you. As we do all these things with the help of the Holy Spirit, we put on love. We put on love. Not only must we put on love, but number two, we must, in spiritual clothes, we put on those spiritual clothes that help us rest in our Savior. Put on those spiritual clothes to help us rest in our Savior. And all of us like rest, don't we? 
I'm going to take a Sunday afternoon nap, then I've got to cut it a little early because we've got deacons meetings. And I'm praying those deacons don't get long-winded like I do a lot of times. But No, I'm just kidding. But verse 15, Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, so which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Clothing ourselves in Christ also allows us to be ready to relax. In our culture today, it's so easy for our hearts and our minds to be filled with tension, anxiety, fear, frustrations for everyday life can fester. We can just be all kinds of anxious, depressed. Depression is, is, all, is prevalent. And so this causes our lives to be anything but peaceful, don't it? But in Christ, <clears throat> though there is an abundance of peace, and it can be found, and it can be experienced, because of Christ and all He's done for us, we can have peace with our Creator, peace with our conscience, and peace in all circumstances. All circumstances. It doesn't matter where you're at, what you're going through, what you're seeing, what you're facing, you can have His peace. Philippians 4, 7 says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. John 14, 27 says, Jesus says, Peace I leave you with you. My peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. His peace can rule or control hearts as we trust in the Lord. And place our confidence in Him. When our hearts find His peace, and we get on a collision course and they find each other, Oh, then we experience the peace we've been missing. And we gain a proper perspective on everything. And the only thing that we can do is become overwhelmingly thankful. That's all we can do. I, I don't know about you, but there's a lot of times I'm just thankful and I don't know how to express it to the Lord. And it's okay to show Him with tears. And it's okay to say, Lord, I, I, I don't know what else to say in prayer. But thank you. He knows. And it's okay. A heart that is totally filled with gratitude can be thankful for all things and in all circumstances. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. In all circumstances, Pastor? Yeah. All of them. Every one of them. Give thanks. The Lord knows what He's doing. And He has a plan, a purpose. A lot of times we don't understand His plan and purpose. But we've got to trust Him. We've got to trust Him. Philippians 4, 6 and 7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And again, that peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Not only must we put on love and peace, but number three, we must put on spiritual clothes that help us rejoice in our Savior. Rejoice. According to verse 16 of our main text, the best garment to put on is rejoice in Christ and His Word. Just as clothing ourselves with Christ makes us suitable for service, ready to serve Him, ready to relax, dress according to our identity with Him, it also helps us prepare to, to praise Him. You say prepare to praise Him, yeah. Get your praise on. Be prepared to praise Him. Be prepared at all times to, if you have to, if you, if you feel led, lift up a hand. It's okay. Lift up a hand and praise. Clap them hands. The Bible says that David danced a jig before the Lord. I'm paraphrasing again. He didn't really say that, but David danced before the Lord, did he not? You know what I'm talking about. David danced before the Lord. Just as clothing ourselves with Christ makes us suitable for service, we also got to be suitable for praise. When we really grasp our spiritual identity and who we are in Christ, His identity not only just fills our heart with love and peace, but it primes the pump, if you will, to overflow in celebration of our Lord and Savior. And there's sometimes, there's sometimes we, we don't, you say, Pastor, I come to church and I get in my pew and I just don't feel like worshiping. I just don't feel like singing. Sing anyway. Sing anyway. I tell Jen all the time. Lately we've been stressed to the max and, and doing all this and moving and doing all and unpacking. Well, she has. <laughs> Packing and unpacking and I've been in the hospital a lot, but 
I said, don't lose your song. Don't lose your, your song, your worship, your ability to worship, even in spite of who you are, what you're going through, where you're at. That's my, that's my tidbit this morning to you. That's my encouragement. Don't lose your song. Don't lose your song. Let God's Word, let God's Word dwell in your heart when you go to worship. And the word dwell here means to feel at home if we have experienced His grace and His saving power. We're going to feel right at home in his, his house. This is His house. We're going to feel at home here. And we're going to be able to experience and to, re, and to, and to really dive in into the rich Word of God and how it can strengthen and enhance our life. Worship Him in spirit and in truth. Give Him all you got. Don't you come in here and halfway worship Him. He doesn't want that. He doesn't want leftovers. He wants all of it. He wants all you got. The great verse in Colossians 3.16 is not just for us as individuals, but it applies for all of us as a church body. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. There's something about, there's just something about worshiping it. There. There's something about singing God's word. And, and, and you know what? I, I saw this the other day and I really believe it. Somebody on social media had said, I hadn't heard from God. I don't hear from God. Somebody else said, well, well, read his word. I want God to speak audibly to me. Speak it out loud. <laughs> and it's true. If you want to hear from God, speak out his word. He's already talked to you. He's got a love letter just for you. It's called his word. Recite it. Speak it. And when we get to sing psalms and sing praise songs and sing other, other different songs that have scripture in them, you know what you're doing? You're in love telling God back His Word. And you know what? That brings God joy, doesn't it? That, bring, that brings God, I, I have to believe that brings a smile on the Lord's face. That we are singing His Word to Him. There's nothing like hearing Scripture being sung, isn't there? Such a blessing to rejoice in the Lord by reciting and singing. Addressing one another in, in, in psalms and hymns or spiritual songs. When the Lord and all He's done for us is exalted in worship, it's then, it's then that we're going to feel true gratitude. Our worship to Him must be filled with the truth of the gospel, and it also must promote a deeper closeness with Him. I don't know about you, but I want to get closer and closer and closer with the Lord. And there's times that I need, I need my pump primed, so i gotta find my, I got to find songs that I know where I can just praise the Lord. And even now, I, I, talk about, I talk about Jen and the boys a lot, but even now, we'll be going down the road. We was going down the road this morning, and I started kind of humming along and whistling. And Daddy says, or Daddy, Noah says, Daddy, turn some music on. I said, you don't like my singing? No. Okay. So I turned some worship on. And just in a little bit, he was singing along with me. He loves to listen to Worship. He loves to sing along. He loves to sing to the Lord, even though he doesn't know the Lord yet. We're going we're gonna to get there. But it's amazing how singing out, singing praises to the Lord, will bring you to a place where you feel like worshiping. You say, I don't feel like worshiping. Sing anyway. Sing anyway. Finally, this morning, to be well-dressed for Christ. We must put on spiritual clothes to help us be active and run to our Savior. Run to our Savior. He's, verse 17 says, And whatever you do in word or deed, everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to Father, the God the Father through Him. Everything you do ought to be in the name of the Lord Jesus. Word or deed. Our wardrobe as Christians is not only appropriate and suitable for service, ready to relax, Prepared for praise. It's also active that it helps us run the race set before us. I don't know about you, but I want to be someone that can one day, with every fiber of my being, hear two words. Well done. You run the race. You did it. 
I want the Lord to be able to say, well done to me. I, I want to be just like 1 Timothy 4, 7 where Paul says, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Don't you quit. Don't you waver. Don't you say, I, I can't do it no more, Lord. I've had enough. Lord, I'm tired. If you get tired, He is your strength. You go to the Lord and you say, Lord, I need you. I think about that, that picture we've all seen of one set of footprints on that beach. You've seen that? You say, well, where am I at, Lord? I only see one set of footprints. Well, that's me. That's me carrying you, the Lord says. How many times has the Lord had to carry you and me? We lost count, hadn't we? But He'll do it time after time after time after time. The Lord will carry you through. He'll carry you through. He will. As Christians, we belong to Jesus. And all that we say or do should be associated with Him. Well, our words and our works should glorify Him in His name. I know it's past 12 o'clock. God ain't holding the stopwatch. Y'all give me a minute. Y'all give me just a minute. I'm almost done. If we allow anything in our lives that should be associated with His, or shouldn't be associated with His name, that's called sinning. And we shouldn't be doing it. We must do and say everything on the authority of the name of Jesus. Again, I'm going to ask you to do what I've done before. Just say that name with me. Say Jesus. Jesus. Oh, doesn't it give you peace to say His name? Doesn't it give you joy? Doesn't it give you hope? Bearing His name is a great privilege, but with great privilege comes great responsibility. Doing something in the name of Jesus is like authorizing a contract with His signature on it. Recently, we closed on our house, and I think I got carpal tunnel by the time I got done signing all them things, all them papers. I said, bless God, can't I just initial some of this? Or verbally tell you it's all right? Do y'all sign these? I had to sign and sign and sign and felt like I was a baseball player getting autographs. It was sort of, you couldn't read it by the end. But that's what we do. It's almost as if we're putting our stamp of approval on that. And the Lord is as well. Doing something in the name of Jesus is like a contract. With the name of Jesus signed at the bottom of your life, like a check, signed at the bottom of your life, you're doing all things with His reputation on the line and in mind, and you're one of His representatives in this world around you. You are His representative. Are you going to act like it? Hebrews 12, 2, I love what it says. Therefore, since we've been surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God, the author and perfecter of our faith. He's the one that's going to get you through. If you're one of His... I want to encourage you this morning. Continue to run the race set before you. You can do it because you're not alone. The founder and perfecter of our faith is with you every step of the way. You're well dressed for Christ. Go serve Him. Go love. Go show others your Savior. Let's pray in His name. Father, we come to you this morning, Lord. We thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for your many blessings. Lord, I know I tarried this morning. But Lord God, I had some things on my heart I needed to say. Let us be well dressed for Christ, Lord. Well dressed for you. Put, play the part. Act the part. Look the part. Let's not just say we're a Christian. Let's act like it. Lord God, we ask this morning... That you'd go before us and do a work that only you can do. Maybe there's those this morning, they've been toying with the idea of joining our church. Making it home. Making our church their home. You're leading them here. Let them come this morning and make it official. Lord God, this morning, there may be some that say, Pastor, I, I can't dress for Christ because I don't know Him. I've realized I don't know Him. You can... You can become a child of God this morning and leave here forever changed. Just come up here and say, Pastor, I want to know Jesus. I want to know Jesus. And we'll pray. 
And I'll show you how it's easy as ABC to come to Jesus Christ. Maybe you need to rededicate your life. You've claimed to be a Christian at one time, but you hadn't been looking the part. You hadn't been acting the part. Come home. That's, that's the message of the gospel. You can always come home. No matter who you are, where you are, what you've been doing, who you've been doing it with, come home. Come home. Come back to me. Father, may they come this morning and do business with you. It's in your name we pray.